Hallelujah. You know that every third Sunday evening we have uh, uh, the good habit of speaking about families. Uh, so I invite you guys to open the scriptures up to Genesis chapter 4, where we'll read from verse 16 up to verse 26. The first book of the Bible from chapter 4, starting with verse 16 up to verse 26. And let's follow this passage together. So, Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, Irad, sorry, and Irad was the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael was the father of Methusaleh. And Methusaleh was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other named Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who lived in tents and raised livestock. His brother's name was uh, Jubal, and, and he was the father of all those who played string instruments and pipes. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for my inju a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech. 77 times. Adam made love to his wife again and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Amen. You can sit back down. I'm very happy for each and every one of you that chose to be here tonight and to strengthen our hearts into, into the word of the Lord. I'd like to speak to you today about one of the hardest responsibilities that I received from God, the responsibility of being a parent. I believe that every man on earth, the responsibility of being a parent uh, catches them completely off guard. Whenever I hear people saying that I'm not ready, I ask them, when will you be? And they say, after five years, after X amount of years, and you'll never be. Whoever believes that if they go to a parenting course and if they read books and if they listen to others who are wiser than and themselves that I've already gone through, through being a parent, they'll be ready. And the sad news is you won't. I read a bunch of books. I had a bunch of conferences. And when I held my child for the first time, I felt completely helpless. I said, God, you gave me this baby and I have no clue what I need to do. And despite, I preach, despite preaching you every, every week, Many times I feel like uh, I, I look towards you guys almost as, as towards my children and I feel like I don't know what do I, need, I need God's help. I definitely need God's help. I definitely need God's help. And, you know, again, I warn you guys who aren't parents, it, you, you'll never be ready for, for having a child. There is no right time to have a child. What is the right time for a child to come into a certain family? There isn't one. Yesterday was the best moment. If it wasn't yesterday, then try catch the moment again. Try thinking this way and think. see things this way. If you consider there will be a moment for you to be, a, if, if you consider that there will be the perfect time for you to be a parent, there will be a time where it will be the best time. You'll be qualified to be a parent. No, everyone learns to be a parent on their own children. And that's why some of us, so that's why we're so different. We're so, so, so spread apart. There isn't any specialists to say, only our grandparents, our grandparents are specialists. You know, they look at, at our children and they, they say, don't do this, don't do that. But, you know, we, we don't tend to listen to anyone when we raise our child. You know, we, we like to do it our own way anyway. So there is nothing to prepare us. So even if this moment catches us completely unprepared, we cannot run away from this responsibility, all of us that have become parents and all of you that want to be parents. There is something very interesting here and I think we'll speak about it again. You see, the Bible says that Abraham 
uh, uh, gave birth to, to Isaac. And this is, you know, the, did, did he go through the pains of, of birth? Or, and it's not about this. If, if, if women give birth to children biologically, fathers give birth to children, uh, to, I, through, their identity uh, is given by their fathers. They, fathers give birth to, one, to a child's identity. Yeah. Um, a father that doesn't recognize his, or his child or that he never adopts as his own, you know, he gives birth, he feeds him, he, he buys him clothes, he, he buys him stuff, but he never holds him to, to his chest, hugs him or spends time with him. There are many fathers and this is called uh, uh, passive, passive um, abandoning. And I want to tell you that there is this risk of running away from the responsibility of being a parent. And this is a madness. God has given you children and will give you children, puts them on your shoulders of all of you that become parents. They give you the, he gives you the responsibility to give this child direction and to grow him, to raise him. We all want what is best for our children, all of us. I don't know any parent that doesn't love the children. I, I don't know any, any one of you that wouldn't want what is best for, for his child. I don't know any of you that aren't ready to sacrifice themselves completely for their children. When, it's, when, when we speak about our children, there is no limit. You give your heart, your, 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 donate your, your, you donate both your, your kidneys to save them. There is, uh, it's a love that is almost unheard of in any other circumstance of our life. Even though we all want to offer our children what is best, we don't offer, we don't all offer the same things to, to our children. And when it comes to what we offer our children, the differences between us are, are amazing, are, are, are huge. Even if we all want to give what is best to our children, this best, quote unquote, is so different in the minds of people that sometimes it's almost completely contrary. That's why many people offer their children things that in their mind they think will do well for them, but that could have the opposite effect. And I said so many times, the differences are so big that uh, what we have, what we offer our children, even if we speak about, uh, you know, children that are, uh, that are closely related, family members, cousins, or closely related children. And today we're going to look at, at uh, some parents and how they uh, worked with this responsibility and how the lives of, of their children were, were influenced by, by the parenthood. I don't want to be long, uh, I don't want to preach for too long this, this afternoon, but I want to give you a couple of things to, to think about, to ponder. And I'd like us to, to look at verse 16, to start off with verse 16. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. All of you know the story of uh, uh, Abel and Cain and how Cain killed his brother Abel. And when you read the biblical story, you feel you get the sensation that Cain and Abel were uh, two completely different people, two, two kids, sorry. But they were two fully grown men. He, when Cain killed Abel, they were, he was about 30 years old. They weren't two teenagers, two kids that in, in a fit of rage killed the other. No, they were two fully grown men, two adults. Cain, when he killed uh, Abel, was a, 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 was a man with his heads on his shoulders. He knew what he was doing when he was killing him. And when Cain killed his brother, even though uh, God warned him, Cain, don't forget something, that sin is close to you. Sin, the, the, the desire of sin holds on to you, but you need to master it. God saw that Cain's heart was filled with frustration and anger, and God, God warned him, Cain, if you're going to carry on on this path, on this journey, you're going you're gonna to do something wrong, you're going to misstep. And he says, okay, whatever, God. And he, they go out, and, and he kills his brother. And God asks Cain, where's your brother, Cain? And Cain says, am I the protector of my brother? And God says, listen, Cain, the blood of your brother Abel shouts from, from the ground to me. And God uh, punishes Cain. And tells him that from today onwards, you're going to be 
a, a foreigner to every land. You're going to be a wanderer for the rest of your life. And the symbolism is interesting in the Old Testament. Cain goes to live in the land of Nod, away from the, the face of the Lord. Nod means... Uh, uh, a, a wanderer, a deserter. So a, a man who's a wanderer himself, who's, who's forever a, a foreigner, goes to live in a land that apparently, as he thought, was away from, from the face of the Lord, a, a place of, of wanderers, a, a, a nowhere, to, in other words. He was one of the first, the third man that was born on the earth, Cain. Well, technically, the, 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 clearly one of the first people on, on, on earth altogether. But God, Cain and God had a special relationship. As, as Imagine what a sensation for you to, to be filled with frustration, to think to re take a revenge from God, to, to take a revenge on your brother, and for God to come to you, and not to speak to you through birds or anything, but to tap, for God to tap you on your shoulder and say, Cain, come on, what's wrong with you? For God to literally warn you and speak to you like that, like, like a friend of us. Cain had a special relationship with God. God spoke to Cain in a direct way and gave him advice. And God told uh, Cain, verse, uh, verse 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not, but if you do, but if you do, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God warned him. God forewarned him. And look in the scripture at, at what intentions God has with Cain. Cain was a criminal. And God tells Cain, you'll be a foreigner. And then Cain comes and cries, God, if you flee, if you, you make me flee, everyone's gonna, anyone's going to kill me. Someone can kill me. They're going to want revenge. And him, the criminal, was worried about being killed. Interesting, right? And Cain, Cain responds and says, then... Uh, now Cain said to his brother, uh, uh, sorry, if, uh, if we look over on verse, um, if we go further down in, in, in Genesis, um, Cain speaks to, to God and says, God, please help me out. God is, uh, you can't punish me this way. And I think about the audacity. This guy just killed his brother and now he's, he's, uh, he's pleading to be, to be be spared for his life, not to be killed. So, there's a bunch of parts that that are missing from Genesis. There's there's quite a few parts that are missing, and uh, we can uh, the, 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 we, the, 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 from looking back onto records. We can uh, analyze and see that uh, both Cain and Abel had relationships with other people. They, they had friends, they had uh, family members, and so there were people that were out for revenge for Cain for what he had done to, to uh, Abel. Uh, this isn't written in the book of Genesis, but there was clearly people looking out to kill him because Cain was clearly worried for it. And that's why Cain says, whoever will find me will kill me. But God says, don't worry, Cain. If anyone will kill you, I will avenge you seven times. In other words, God says, listen, Cain, because I love you so much, even if you are a criminal, I'll give you my protection. And there is no man that will touch you without angering me seven times over. And God decided a sign for, for Cain that whoever will find him should not kill him. This Cain almost gets a, a lifelong insurance, a lifelong protection. But after being punished, God uh, says, uh, promises Cain something else. Cain, I want to rehabilitate you. I want to lift you back. I want you to become, once again, a, one, one of my people. And Cain, instead of using this opportunity that God gives him, Cain goes and runs away from God in, in the land of Nod. Cain, the, the wonder, the deserter, Cain, the, 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 the foreigner, goes off into a foreign land. Him, one of the first people in the earth. When Cain was, was uh, born, he was the third man ever born. But he chose free, willingly to separate himself from God. He was there in, 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 the intimacy, in intimacy with God, participated at moments when God spoke to his parents and Cain chooses 
willingly to separate himself from God. But you know what's interesting, and here's what I wanted to end up. Cain had a child, and he gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son, Enoch. Don't have the impression that Cain and his wife were more prepared than us when they became parents. No. Once they were put before this reality of becoming a parent, immediately Cain took a decision. And it's interesting the decision that Cain takes. Cain decides to offer his son a city to carry his name. A city. Yeah. Cain, for his child, when his child is born, he starts up a whole city for him, names it after him. Now, could you imagine what we're talking about here? Why did he want to start a city for him? Why? Well, for two reasons. For a sure future and for reputation. Cain, as a true father, we'd say, gave his son a... a inheritance, a certainty, protection, military protection, financial protection, a whole city to revolve around him, and gave him a name. Who are you? I'm the one that owns this city. Everything you see here is mine. What does Enoch mean? It means teacher, master. Cain gives his name, his child a name to, to rest him on a social ladder, to rest him high on the social ladder. He wanted his son to have a guaranteed future, to have a reputation, to be put on a, on a social ladder in a high place. In antiquity, the, the highest man in society was the ecclesiast or the teacher, Enoch. Enoch. Is there anything bad in this, in any of this? No, it's not bad for you to want a, a future for your child, to build your child a future, to assure them a, a future of, of some sort, so to create a good reputation for them. But if you're only offering him this or her this, it's not enough. Most decisions that you take today, you can't see their effect or, except over years on end. I told you, many of us take decisions today without thinking long term, what will happen. We take decisions and we measure them two days, three days, a week, one year. A lot of us maybe forgot about the decisions that we took years ago. But we, when we choose to do things, we choose to teach our children things, we forget to look in the long term, in the long run, to see the effects that it will have on, on our children to see where, where it will lead them. Most decisions, as I said, time checks them out. And so the decisions that we take today, we'll see in generations to come. And let's look at Cain's generation. Enoch, um, Enoch was born, uh, Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was father of uh, Mehujael, and Mehujael was the father of Methuselah, and Methuselah was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women and named uh, one named Ada and another named Zila. Ada gave birth to Jabal and so on. It's the first moment in the Cain's uh, uh, family tree that the people uh, 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 changed the standard that uh, uh, God set as a family, a man and a woman. The first time in history in Cain's family tree a man changes God's standards, getting himself two wives. Um, one named Ada and the other named Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal and he was father of those who lived in tents and raised livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all those who played stringed instruments and pipes. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools, bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama, and so on. We'll look in parallel too. You will never find anyone in Cain's uh, family tree to be worried about God. Cain left for his his uh, uh, his his, his uh, children and his, his followers a business, a, a a social mindset to be to care all about themselves, their reputation, their their 
what they do, their jobs. But if it's just this, it's too little. From the moment Enoch was born, Cain uh, sorted his, his life out in the long run. You're going to become strong. You're going to have a social position. You're going to need. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. You're going to be a great man. And looking in his his uh, uh, followers, his children, his his children's children, you'll see that people were completely and mostly worried about their, their financial status, their, their social status. And if you go, if we carry on, verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Adler and Zillah, listen to me, wives in Lamech. Hear my words, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. A young man refers to a child here. I have killed a child for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Pride, selfishness, and the hatred that Cain had gets amplified with every new generation of people that followed him. Interesting, no? Cain's hatred doesn't uh, doesn't change it, does it, or doesn't fall, but it, it gets amplified with every new generation of people that follows him. Don't believe that these two are completely coincidental. No, you carry your parents' DNA. What you saw in your own household will influence you, yes, and it's true that you can change your life, but you carry with you a luggage. It comes from your childhood, says Exuberi. I come from my childhood, that's from a foreign country. I am influenced by how I lived, by the things that I've seen growing up. And from generation to generation, Cain's followers develop hatred, pride, selfishness. And this man, Lamech, because he was insulted, he was hurt, he was wounded, he didn't hesitate for a second to kill. And not only did he kill, but there's a phrase that Jesus uh, says. He says that if any of you touch uh, Lamech, they won't receive what is right, but they'll receive a total revenge. Whoever touches me, says Lamech, I'll avenge myself 77 times. In other words, uh, it's, it's, my revenge will be limitless. That's why when, Je when Peter asks uh, Jesus, how many times should we forgive our, our brothers and sisters? Uh, Jesus says 77 times seven. You know, 77 times to forgive someone is, is reasonable, right? When we look in, in the, 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 the high scheme of things. But Jesus says 77 times by seven. In other words, limitless, forgive him always. Cain's trust in, in wealth and uh, social status and so on uh, led his, his uh, children and his followers to, to death. And if we go on a few chapters onwards in Genesis chapter 6, it says God looked towards the earth and every, every, every man's thoughts was, was uh, tailored towards evil, towards hatred. And what did God do? God ended up killing everyone through a flood. When you try to teach your children, teaching them that everything that matters in this world is financial safety, uh, military safety, to be strong, to be rich and wealthy, when you teach your children that the only things that matter is how others will see you, will look at you, you leave an inheritance that amplifies pride, selfishness, hatred, and you will see how with every generation that follows after you, these things won't fall, but they'll get amplified, they'll increase. Cain and Enoch are a model of people that we have today, a group of people that exist today that, that believe that everything that matters in life is to be strong, to be looked good upon and to be rich and wealthy. Adam made love to his wife again and he gave birth to a son named Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. And there's such a big difference between the approach that Eve has, the mother of the two, when Cain is born. You know what Cain means? It's very interesting. The word Cain means comes from the verb to obtain or to realize, to accomplish, almost a predestined name. Cain means to obtain, to realize, to accomplish. When, Cain, when Eve gives birth to, to Cain, Eve told herself, I have received the man, I, was, I produced the man with God's help. And everything here sounds sound of warm, sort of a thankfulness. God, I thank you. In Hebrew, it sounds completely different. You know what it sounds? He says, I have accomplished 
and made a man like God, just as God made people. This is how I make people. This is this is what Eve was thinking in her, in her mind. The expression is very weird. She says, just as God has created people, I can too create people. Almost praising her ability, praising this this miracle of giving birth. I have obtained, I have I've accomplished, I have accomplished the task of making a man. Me and Adam made a man, made a human. We're like gods. That's why she 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 called him Cain. Uh, accomplishment, obtainment. Eve has a dose of pride in, in her report to God because she was able to give birth to someone, to a human. Cain is the father to those that, that believe that they can obtain anything through their own uh, powers, their own, their own ability. And what a curse this is for everyone that believes that they can obtain anything through their own ability. But ob observe what Eve says when she gave birth to Seth. Um, Saying, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel. God has granted me another. The difference, like what a great difference between I was able to make a child and I received, God has granted me a child. Eve changed her mentality, realizing that the seed that Eve gave birth to was one of a criminal. And now she says, I have received, I have been granted a child from, from God. Why did uh, Eve name this child Seth? Seth means seed, and it cannot take you to the thought that uh, it, 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 this, brings, this brings about a, a reminder to the first biblical prophecy that, that God made to, to people, that uh, God tells us things, that there will be war between your seed and, and their seed, and you will... He will, the, the seed of man will crush your head and you will only be able to scratch his heel. Uh, in this child, Eve saw the, the promise man of God that, that God will bring a, a liberator to, for humanity. And when this man grew old, Seth, observe the difference. Uh, Seth also had a son and he named him Enosh, which means man. But the idea of fragility, of a limited man, that's what Seth gave, uh, that's how Seth called his, his child Enosh. And as soon as Seth gives birth to his first child, then, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. That's how Genesis 4 ends. When uh, Seth's first child is born, overwhelmed by re the responsibility of being a parent, what do they start doing? They start searching for God. They start. They begin to call on the name of the Lord. Cain, when he's a parent for the first time and he realizes that he carries on his shoulders the responsibility of a child, he starts building cities, guaranteeing a safety, a, 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 a sure future for his child. Whilst, on the other hand, Seth, when he becomes a parent for the first time in his life, he starts searching God and calling on God's name. And the start of this journey it begins to influence other people. And the scripture says that at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord people, so more than one, more than just seven. Isn't this contrast interesting from two people that come from the same family? Both of them from Adam and Eve, when one of them realizes that they become a parent, they only feel the pressure of reputation, of, of, of wealth, of finance, of financial security, of materialistic security and safety. Meanwhile, safe, Seth begins to worry himself about God, about having God help him out. And let's look at something together. And let's read together the, the family tree of, of Seth. Genesis chapter 5, starting with verse 6. And observe together with me what effect it had in the long run. This decision that Seth had to grow their ch his children in another mindset, mentality. Observe alongside me. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became father of Enosh. So he was 105 when he gave birth to his first child. For 101st year, 105 years, he was a bachelor. He partied, he lived his life. But at 105, he became father of Enosh. And this man who should be mature wakes up and says, Hey, what am I doing? And he starts looking for God. 
and starts calling on his name. And now verse 7. After he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had, another, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived a total of 912 years and then he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. After he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enosh lived a total of 905 years and then died. When Kenan lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahalael. After he became the father of Mahalel, Kenan lived 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Kenan lived a total of 910 years and then he died. When Mahalel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. After he became the father of Jared, Mahalel lived 830 years and had other sons and daughters. When you read this family tree, uh, you feel like the guy that had just died didn't meet the guy that, that previously had, 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 had died and so on. Look on Google and search Genesis 5 to, to show you how many were contemporary with one another. You'll see that Adam was contemporary close to, to, to Noah. So they knew each other. So if you look at Anash, Anash lived long enough to also see Jared and, Mah and so on. And we carry on reading. After uh, altogether, Mahal lived a total of 895 years and then he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he, be he became father to Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared, Jared lived 800 uh, years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived a total of 962 years and then he died. When Enoch lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. After he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah had lived a total of 969 years and then died. He's the guy that lived the, the most years in the Bible. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. If you look in the uh, family tree, and th what I was saying before is that Adam lived to see a bunch of his great, 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 great grandchildren. But if we look in this family tree, there's a bunch of great names here. Um, Enoch, Noah. And this all started because of, of, of the seed that they had planted in, in, in the hearts of their children from, from a young age. Why this family tree? You'll see and you'll look in the scripture that Cain's uh, family tree disappears. Immediately after Lamech, he's born, he gives birth to four children and no one else. The Bible doesn't speak of it anymore. But Seth's uh, family tree, if you go into Matthew at the beginning, God makes a direct connection between Adam and Jesus going through Seth and all the other patriarchs because they're loved ones. There's a great difference between the way that a, a, a proper family tree is, is, is born and constructed, starting off with what it is you give your children, a, a city, a town, a social rank, or God. I told you the story for a, a purpose. Over us, all this responsibility of being a parent is put on. All of us want to become parents. Some of you are already parents. Cain also thought that he was giving Enoch what was best for him. But what was best for, for Enoch in Cain's mind was completely different to what Seth thought was best for his child. And I'd like to provoke you and, and to think about it. What are we giving our children? Are we just giving them houses, clothes, cars, a future, their daily bread, financial safety, security? But are we giving them a God, a true God, a God for us to have first? Because observe, before Seth uh, was able to, to uh, raise his child, he himself had to realize that he needed God before he could put God and, and seed him uh, in, in the heart of his child. 
at 105 years he realizes that he's completely unprepared and he starts looking for God truly completely and in this search for God he installs in the heart of his child this search for God and his child puts it on to his child and his child onto his child and so on and people start looking and people start calling on God and from this family tree the great people of, of, of God are born Psalm 106 there's a responsibility that we have to put in the hearts of our children God so that their children so that they can teach their children and their children to their children and from generation to their generation this truth this this uh, treasure this 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 set of values to be passed on we're all under the same pressure between offering our children a, a future and financial stability or to offer them God and what do I, why do I tell you or and not and? Because any man that wants to give his child more than anything, a reputation and a future, they can't really offer them God from the very beginning or offer them God completely. I want to tell you this and please remember what I tell you. I don't care and I want you guys not to care about offering your children clothes, cars, other things. But before everything, I want you to care about giving God to your children because if they learn about God and they learn about God's miracles, about God's works, about protecting God's commandments, they learn that from you. God will give them everything else they need, they want. If they learn from you not to take care of God's commandments, not to take care of God's miracles, not to learn to trust God, His teachings, His works, they will never learn them from anywhere else. You, you are owed and you have the responsibility to teach this to your children. Don't put this job on anyone else's shoulders. A lot of people run from, from early morning to evening. Fathers here that leave early in the morning and come late at night wanting to build a future for their child. They go to work and they work two jobs, triple shifts. And that future, the future that you'll construct your children will destroy them if you don't make some time for them to hear from your mouth the stories from the Bible, the stories of God, how God has worked for you, how if he doesn't hear you pray, if he doesn't hear, it, Sunday school shouldn't be the first to teach your child about David. You should be. You should teach him about David and Goliath. You should teach him. If we're not ready to give the, our children a, a baggage of, of responsibilities, maybe you feel completely inadequate. God, I don't know how to do this. How should you do this? You start looking for God, just like Seth done. Start getting to know God personally. No one, uh, Papa Benedict the, the, the 16th said, a superb thing. No one can take a man where he isn't. I cannot take my children in the presence of God if I myself am not in the presence of God. It's impossible. I cannot teach my children to pray if I don't pray. I cannot teach my children to pray, to, to, give, on, to give themselves up for God if I'm not giving myself up. How do I teach my children to listen to God if I'm not the one listening to Him? How can it's useless? We can all speak and say good sermons to our children, but they look at who we are, they look at me, they look at you, at our reactions, at our words, at the way we behave. And I want to tell you something. What they learn uh, without any words is stronger than any words that we can tell them. I end by asking you, and I like us all to ask ourselves. Are you a Cain or are you a Seth? Are you a man that offers uh, safety, human safety, a, a good future to your children? Or are you a man that offers his child God? You know, I told my children openly. I met up with my family in delivering and I told them, and I, I told them clearly, I don't need anything from you. I need nothing more you can do, whatever you want. You can give away the house that I worked for you. You can sell everything, go on holidays. I don't need anything from you anymore because you have given me enough. You have given me a set of values that lead my life. That's what I told my parents when, when, when I met up with them. From them I gained the... the my mom would look for me out in, in the city on Friday, Friday evenings, Wednesday evenings, Sundays. My mom would search for me and, and, and bring me to church. Back then I used to be angry. I hated it. I was a student in Bucharest and no one checked me to if I would still go to church on Sundays and yet I still went. In Bucharest the churches were Thursday evenings. My colleagues went on Wednesdays to... To, to, to shopping centers, to, to movies, to, to, 
I couldn't do any of that because I had a mentality that I need to go pray. I need to find God. That, that was my routine. And when did I, where did I receive all these things from? My parents. They taught me to give. From them, I learned what it meant to give. They taught me to give to a tenth of all my wealth to, to the church. They were, they were, 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 whether they had money or not, they were people that were consistent in this. And if I look further back, I find this at my grandparents and at my great grandparents and so on. And I want to tell you something. This, uh, th these values are given down from generation to generation. And maybe in your generation there was no one you were a generation of, of, of you're, you're part of Cain's generation man. do you not want to be the first Seth God teach me how to how to install in their hearts your values your morals but first make me a man that knows you are you a Seth or a Cain are you a man that builds cities for their children or searches for God to be able to, to give them eternal safety and security that comes from God. We all carry the hard responsibility of, parent, of parenthood, or we all want to enter this responsibility of parenthood. But we differentiate so much from one another on what it is that we want to offer our children, thinking that we're giving them what is best. Give them God's values, teach them about His miracles, His commandments, teach them about God's works, and you'll see how God will take care the next generation and the next one to come. You came to London and you didn't even have a house, you had no, you didn't even have a spoon to eat with. Do you think God will, will ruin the life of your, 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 your children, the next generations to come? God won't abandon them the same way that God hasn't abandoned you, the same way that God has protected you and has led you, has, 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 has held you hand in hand. God hasn't abandoned you the same way. He will not abandon your children. Don't illusion yourself thinking that we can give them the future. We can't. The future is in God's hands. Amen. We can give them a single thing. A God for them to trust in. A God for them to see that we, we trust and rely on. If we're able to give our children this living God, true God that lives, and if we're able to teach them about this, we're giving them everything that they need. They need nothing more than that. Because God will give them the bread they need, the house they need, the clothes they need. Don't worry, this is God's job, not yours. It's not your job to build four houses, one was for all the, 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 the kids and your grandchildren and so on. Your job is just to offer them a God. I'd like this to be the thought that we meditate on. Are you a Seth or a Cain? And look at this based on the worries that you have every day. These define you. About what you speak about every day. What are your subjects? What subjects do you, you talk about? Your topics? Money? Things? Business? When was the last time you spoke to your children about God? About His miracles? About His works? When was the last time you spoke to them about the miracles that God has done in your life? When you were desperate, God has come before you. Search to be a Seth, not a Cain. I'd like us to stand up and pray, and may the Lord listen to our prayers. Amen.